New America would like to welcome you to our virtual event. The program will begin momentarily. While we are waiting, I want to review a few housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded, and a recording will be posted to the New America events page within 48 hours after the event. Attendees will be in listen-only mode, and you will not be able to be seen or heard by your fellow attendees or panelists. Therefore, we encourage you to share your comments and questions in the Slido box located to the right of the video. Closed captioning is available by hovering over the video and clicking CC at the bottom of the video. You can purchase your copy of the book by clicking on Purchase the Book, which can be found at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. If you encounter any issues during the event, please contact events at newamerica.org. Thank you for joining us. We will begin momentarily. Thank you for joining us for this event uh, with Erica Gaston, who uh, has written a new book, Illusions of Control, Dilemmas in Managing U.S. Proxy Forces in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. I'm Peter Bergen, uh, Vice President at New America. Erica is Senior Policy Advisor, Head of the Conflict Prevention and Sustaining Peace Program at the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. She's also an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, a non-resident fellow both at the Carnegie Endowment and the Global Policy Institute, the Global Public Policy Institute. She's also done quite, an, quite a lot of work for New America on the subject of proxy warfare in the past. So we're really pleased that she's going to be able to present uh, her book today. She's going to talk about her book, uh, the big themes and ideas in the book. I'm then going to engage her in a Q&A, and then I'm also going to bring in questions from the audience. If you have an, a question for Erica, put it in the Slido box, um, and I will uh, feed the questions to her as they come in. All right. Well, thank you, Erica, for doing this, and over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. And uh, thanks all especially to New America, not only for organizing this event and hosting it today, but also for the past support. As you mentioned, some of our past research collaborations together were in fact really formative in some of the field research for this, particularly in Iraq. So thank you for that. Um, I think I'll start maybe by just giving you a little bit of a sense uh, of how this book came about, what some of the examples are that are that are just really telling from the book itself, and maybe then from that dig into what some of the conclusions are. So the kind of origin story for this book, I guess, dates back to 2008, 2009. At the time, I was working in Afghanistan as a human rights researcher. And it, you know, that this was the height of the sort of counterinsurgency moment in Afghanistan. There's preparations for a surge of forces to counter the Taliban. You know, it real focus on winning back areas, winning Afghan hearts and minds. And one of the strategies proposed by special forces to do that was to put support behind mobilizing tribal or community militias as a sort of counterinsurgency force against the Taliban. It was immediately controversial. So, you know, if there's one country that might make you think twice about mobilizing militias, it's probably Afghanistan. There is a long history of war crimes and abuses perpetrated by militias in Afghanistan. A lot of them contributed to the collapse of the state and sort of really bloody civil war in the 1990s. Not to mention the ultimate case of proxy blowback, which was the U.S. supported uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan, some of them spun off to form Al-Qaeda under Osama bin Laden. So, you know, when this new idea comes about U.S. putting more money behind tribal mobilization, critics, you know, were vehement. You know, starting, you know, going from this would undo a decade of investments in state building and disarmament to this would hand areas over to roving militias and the Taliban to, um, you know, pointing to a similar local police force initiative the year before that had failed spectacularly. They were, you know, the group was likened more to, to robbers than cops. Um, and for each of these potential risks and downsides, special forces had a response or an answer. You know, this time there would be vetting and background checks and training on human rights. You know, there was going to be a code of conduct and restrictions on how far these forces could go outside of their villages, who they could affiliate with, restrictions on narcotics, you know, you name it. And then finally, a host of oversight and accountability mechanisms, ranging from special forces embedding in these areas to, to mentor and monitor them, to placing them under formal Afghan institutions, as well as other kind of tribal, you know, informal control mechanisms, let's say. And it was almost like they were saying, yes, these are risky forces. These are a problem. 
but this time's going to be different. We've got a way to mitigate or address these risks, you know, a sort of you can have your cake and eat it sort of thing. And, and, you know, it's an intriguing idea. It was one that largely didn't pan out. You know, if you look back at the 10 year history of this force, which became known as the Afghan local police, it's riddled with examples of, you know, them engaging in abuses, uh, contributing to instability, um, really enabling government corruption and predatory behavior in ways that kind of played into the Taliban narrative. So really all of the different risks that we're supposed to be controlled for, you know, nothing happening on them. Now, you might just say the you know, this effort to kind of have your cake and eat it too, to have these militias, but all these mechanisms to control them. Maybe that was just the product of this particular counterinsurgency moment in Afghanistan or the policy dynamics at the time. You know, this was a very public and heated authorization debate about these forces because it was so controversial. So that meant not only were special forces proposing all of these things to try to, you know, assuage critics. Um, but there were also other players who were weighing in, President Karzai and Afghan ministries, um, NATO diplomats, U.S. embassy itself. So, you know, th all of them are proposing different mechanisms and controls for this. So you could say, hey, it's just that particular moment. But then I started working on similar issues um, in Iraq and Syria from 2015 on, very different countries, very different contexts. And yet you started to see the same thing. Not only lots of instances of the U.S. working with different militias and rebel groups, but also the same emphasis on sort of checks and, and controls on them. You know, so for the program in Iraq, for example, um, you know, it's providing support to some 40 to 60,000 different forces. It was supposed to be a sort of redux of the Sahwa or Sons of Iraq program that had preceded it a decade before. You know, they had everything from the same background and checks and vetting to a NATO-supported training program, limitations on weapons, cutoffs and standards that were enforced. In Syria, there was an, an even greater panoply. Now, I don't look at all of the Syria initiatives because there, there are just so many, but I look at five um, in my book from the non-lethal assistance provided by the State Department to the CIA covert support to several of the DOD train and equip variations. And in all of them, you had the same thing. You had vetting programs based on affiliation, on ideology, also on human rights and conduct. You had formal protocols, codes of conduct, really robust training in some of them, um, a range of oversight and monitoring mechanisms, and you know sanctions. Groups were cut off because they transgressed red lines, they committed atrocities, they affiliated with the wrong groups, things like that. You know the the CIA supported. Uh, groups is an interesting example because you think sometimes about CIA proxies, it's a covert control, you know, uh, there's this idea of sort of gloves off with these programs. But in fact, you know, I talked to a lot of the FSA commanders that were supported, as well as policymakers, and there's quite, quite tight controls, you know, when they, some of them received these anti-tank missiles, for example, the tow missiles, very valuable in the field in that context. And they would sort of have to report back to these murder boards of collective intelligence agencies in Turkey and Jordan on how the operation went and what the planning was. And, it, you know, it's this bureaucratization of, of the operations. You know, they'd even have to bring in video evidence and spent missile casings in order to get new ones. And uh, there was one example where a uh, FSA commander shared that there was a group that had misfired and it had caused civilian casualties, which was against a protocol that they were required to sign. Um, and they, you know, were cut off from receiving more, more missiles until they received new training. So, you know, these are just a couple of examples to give you a sense of this practice. But, you know, I looked at over a dozen cases over a 15-year span of time, and you see consistently emerging the standard set of checks or controls of bureaucratic practices that, you know, it, it becomes almost just like a default standard operating procedure when working with these um, sort of forces in these environments. Um, you know, and, and very much closely related in many cases to, you know, what, how these forces get authorized. You know, that's often what the story is about, not just, you know, do these exist, but how do they play a role in them getting authorized? Now, what's the effect of these, you know, both for the forces themselves, but also for the policies? Um, do they work? And <laughs> that comes up a lot. Uh, I'd say, I mean, overall, as you might expect, they're pretty costly, both in terms of manpower and resources. You know, so some of these vettings, let's say with the Syrian groups, they stretched from initially being anticipated to take a couple weeks to taking several months. And as soon as, you know, one piece of derogatory information is found, which couldn't be verified one way or another, 
it would sort of grind everything to a halt. You know, also, you know, as a result, you had these examples. So, you know, uh, the the CIA program, you know, was often known as sort of too late, too little, too late when it was provided. So we talked to FSA commanders and would say once they got through all the red tape, um, the op opportunity for an operation had passed. So as a result, you have a program that cost a billion dollars a year with, with very little evidence of any strategic difference resulting from the program. And then they're also costly in terms of limiting potential partnerships. So extensive vetting ruled out a lot of the actors on the ground. The most extreme example was, you might remember, there was this brief um, first congressionally authorized train and equip program um, that started uh, it not only had kind of all the standard checks I was talking about in terms of, you know, vetting for terrorist affiliation or human rights backgrounds or things like that, um, that they were moderate fighters, but because Congress was very concerned about an expansion of the Syria conflict, they also had restrictions to only fight ISIL and not Assad. And as a result, the program just recruited, you know, dozens of forces instead of thousands of forces. Um, most were sort of the unmotivated fighters that, you know, as soon as they got into Syria, they dumped their Hiluxes and fled and, and, you know, did not very much such that by the summer of 2015, not not a year into the program, you know, Lloyd Austin testifies before Congress that there's only four or five left in the fight at a, a $250 million price tag. So quite, quite costly. Um, did they do good things for, for that cost, you know, undoubtedly some of the attention to vetting and information gathering and monitoring, for sure, some loss of weapons or misconduct was averted or addressed. You know, that said, every, you know, sort of official I interview would say, you know, there's no such thing as perfect vetting in an environment like that, you know, particularly in Syria, where there's just so much flux happening, so hard to know exactly who you're dealing with. Um, certainly substantial weapons and equipment was taken and diverted to Nusra or other elements, you know, impossible to say how much. On the human rights risks, um, you know, across all the programs, some of you who are listening might be familiar. I know you are, Peter, with the Leahy Law, which is a global process for vetting those receiving U.S. security assistance for past gross violations of human rights. So we often think about it with state forces, but it's interesting that it was applied to most of the groups I looked at, which are, you know, non-state in many cases, or at best sub-state forces. Even in Syria, they applied a sort of Leahy-like form of vetting to the Syrian rebel groups that were supported. Um, but an issue with that was, you know, and this is particularly true in Syria, but in all of them, you know, false negatives are pretty common. It's hard to get this information about abuses in the first place, especially in sort of far reaching areas of Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan, where it does exist, it can be hard to link it to a particular commander. So while these background checks were run on most of the commanders supported, it's hard to say that they systematically caught those with blood on their hands and much less to say that they were really creating a deterrent effect. You know, there was just there was a lot of evidence of of abuses that did occur afterwards. Um, and Another tool that kind of came up a lot was this idea of providing training on human rights, which, again, is probably better than nothing. But, you know, for anyone who's ever gone to a training course in their life, <laughs> they'll tell you that, you know, a one off training without reinforcement, you know, and then you send someone into a war zone, it is not going to do much to change behavior. You know, I talked with General Nagata, who ran the first train and equip program, and he, he would talk about his conversations with Congress. And there was a lot of inquiry about how are we going to be sure these forces don't, you know, violate human rights? How are we going to be sure they don't commit war crimes? And he would say, you know, I can train them on the laws of war, but without the ability to send in forces after them, I have no idea if the training will stick, you know, just being honest. So, and then finally, I would just say like, you know, there is a larger issue and maybe we can get into this in questions because it's definitely relevant and more scope. You know, how much are you going to have a deterrent effect from these different kind of training and background checks and cutoffs when there are le much larger loopholes going on. So in Afghanistan, at the same time, some of the U.S. military's closest partners, senior Afghan commanders and governors, are major perpetrators of gross human rights violations, you know, from torture to child abuse, you know, similar issues with some of the Iraqi military. Um, and so it, it can be hard to say, you know, that that local forces are really going to get the message that this is a priority for U.S. governments. Um, it's not to say these had no effect. You know, they had a certainly an important forcing effect in, in bringing these issues to the fore in U.S. policy, but 
but certainly some of that was mitigated. Where were we? Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 So I was just saying, um, you know, it's not to say that you shouldn't try to do some of these human rights checks. You shouldn't be caring about that when supporting forces. Uh, right. And they definitely had some impact. I mean, if nothing else, they were really valuable things like the Leahy law in forcing this sort of conversation within U.S. policy debates. But there was also a little bit of this issue of a sort of check the check the box, you know. So officials said that sometimes it became a question about how to carry out the vetting rather than stay, stepping back to the fundamental question of, of whether this was a good idea, whether we should be funding these groups at all, and what were some of the broader effects for human rights or for the overall strategy. Well, Erica, and, since we're having okay. conversation, yeah, let's can I, can I drill down on that? Now? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, because I mean, the big question I have um, for you is, obviously, you know, you talked about like, the Afghan local police, yeah. Um, and the problems they had, and they were sort of somewhat predictable. And then the Free Syrian Army and the problem, you know, I, I'd forgotten that they were not allowed to fight Assad, which is obviously what they wanted to do. They were only allowed to fight ISIS. And the fact that there were only four of them at the end is kind of an astonishing statistic. And I, but then, you know, I think about the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are the Kurds largely. And that was, I don't know, what, 40,000, 50,000. I mean, that was a huge proxy force that significantly contributed to the defeat of ISIS in Syria and yeah. continues to be an American ally, you know, despite back and forth. And yeah. obviously President Obama and President Trump, two very different people, thought that the thought that this proxy warfare strategy served the interests of the United States, I guess, in the following way. You know, it's less American boots on the ground. I mean, I think about the Iraq, you know, the defeat of ISIS, there were only about 5,000 American troops at, at the height, I think, in Iraq. Uh, almost all in an advise and assist mission. Very few of them were on the front line. There were almost no American casualties. So if I'm an American president and I'm presented with the, the menu of options to defeat ISIS, which would include, you know, reinvading Iraq, well, I'm not going to do that, doing nothing and letting ISIS, you know, essentially take over the country, I'm probably not going to do that either. Yeah. So is this sort of proxy, you know, people... I mean, you know that you've spent your a huge amount of your career thinking about proxy. And why do people use proxy forces? Because it doesn't it doesn't involve their own forces. And for what it, it may not be, there may be some problems either of human rights or maybe of of you know the, the vetting process may be cumbersome or whatever. But ultimately, it's about not having American boots on the ground in another war, in some shape or form. And it's a cost benefit analysis, ultimately. So, I mean, what when you think about, let's just maybe talk about Syria and Iraq, and then we can talk about Afghanistan next. You know, ISIS, the geographical caliphate, has disappeared, more or less, although, you know, obviously bits of it remain. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, 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 the U.S. support of the Syrian in the Kurdish proxies kind of worked well enough for it to be something that, other commanders in chief in the future might think about as a useful model, or do you think it it, it didn't really work? Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought up the SDF because I do look at this group as well. And I think they speak to sort of a broader issue that's going on. And that is like, how are we not just managing some of these sort of downstream risks, security risk, human rights, whatever, but the larger strategic risks that are involved in deciding to go with the strategy or not. And the SDF, as you say, that's a great example of it. The clear reason that the U.S. turned to the SDF, which of course are the you know, Kurdish-led forces in Northeast Syria, for those not familiar with them, um, you know, they're linked to the YPJ, which is a Syrian armed group linked to the PKK. And, you know, the U.S. kind of comes to them late in part because of that link to the PKK. So the PKK, of course, is, you know, an armed group that has engaged in a decades long insurgency with Turkey. Um, for that reason, it's listed as a terrorist organization by the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, so the idea to go there, yes, it was sort of the best last in the view of many in, in the Department of Defense, the only fighting force that was left that could really present a counterweight to ISIS on the ground, short of sending in U.S. forces, which they did not want to do. That's why they turned to them. But really huge political cost of doing that, too, because from Turkey's perspective, the U.S. saying that they're going to send support to the SDF is the same thing as if, you know, they had said, we're going to start arming an al-Qaeda affiliate on the Mexico border. Like that is how they viewed it. And so you are talking about a major potential political risk 
to your most important NATO ally in the region, you know, at a very sensitive piece of time. And, you know, you could have a debate that that was ultimately what needed to be done because there was just no tolerance for sending U.S. forces in. But the issue, and this is what I highlight in my book, is, again, this sort of almost like have your cake and eat it, too. So some of these same very technical, minor control mechanisms, checks, whatever you want to call them, that they attempted with the Afghan and Iraqi forces, they would also put on the SDF and use them to try to persuade Turkey that this wasn't as bad an idea as they thought it was. So they would, you know, say, don't worry, we're going to do this vetting and background check on them. None of them are going to be at all linked to the PKK. And we're going to keep a strict track of all their weapons that we give them. And we'll share it with you all the time. And we'll restrict where they can go. And we'll make sure that the weapons get taken up. You know, none of this is going to be, you know, and Turkey's having none of it. Turkey is not at all. This doesn't persuade them to any degree that this addresses their major security concerns. And a lot of, you know, I talked to, say, U.S. policy officials who were on the ground having to implement this policy. And what it felt like for them was that, you know, they... In Washington, D.C., this seemed like a great way to kind of split the difference and say, well, we'll get to work with ISIL and we won't frustrate our ally Turkey. But in effect, that was a really these were unreconcilable trade offs in U.S. security policy. And rather than deciding, hey, we're going to go with the SDF, but we're going to have major damage in our relationship with Turkey. There was this sort of papering over by trying to have these. And so the issue that I highlight in my book is not, are there never moments where you might consider a proxy strategy, but what we've seen evolving over the last 15 years of trying to address the problems with those proxy strategies through these more tactical or technical level controls can often blind U.S. policymakers to the larger strategic risks that they might be getting into in making these in fact, less effective, making the partnerships themselves more less effective and making the overall policy that they're designed to respond to less effective. Yeah. And I mean, I'm thinking about um, if you're sitting in the Oval Office, you know, typically the, the, the military come in and they say you have three options, um, you know, a massive war, <laughs> do nothing. Yeah. Or sanctions. Right. Uh, and I think a variation of that is you can have a massive war, do nothing, or have a proxy warfare strategy. And I think the sanctions are very enticing for American commanders in chief because it's, it gives the appearance of doing something, even if it doesn't really achieve the policy objectives often. And then proxy warfare must also be pretty attractive because, as you know, President Obama and President Trump both engaged in pretty much the same strategy when it came to ISIS, right? I mean, Trump just took the... Trump took what Obama had been doing starting in 2014, and when he came into office, he just basically, um, you know, he amplified some aspects of the Syria part of it, like he allowed greater latitude for American forces operating in Syria. But, I mean, basically it was the same approach, I think. Um, and so I just wanted to get your sort of thoughts about a the appeal of proxy forces to america i mean to american commanders in chief and and b you know the question of efficacy and then c you know maybe thinking a little bit about you know the the american americans have been involved in lots of wars <laughs> but we see because we're started as an anti-imperial project there's this kind of like we don't I mean, the, the Americans, there's no demand signal from the american public to have lots of boots on the ground anywhere in the world right now where and that's true on the left of the democratic party and the right of the republican party and so so we're in this sort of isolationist phase and i think if you're in an isolationist phase you can guarantee um more proxy warfare probably because it's uh for obvious reasons so mm -hmm. projecting forward um you have looked at Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria over a long period of time. What do you think, what works and what doesn't work? And what are the sort of surprises along the way that people tend to overlook? And you've talked about some about, I mean, you know, obviously we really pissed off Turkey, but President Obama and President Trump said, we can live with that. And at one point, Trump had a conversation with Erdogan, and was going to pull all his support from the Syrian Democratic Forces and then was persuaded by others to to not do that. But um, 
Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I'd love to respond to just a couple bits of that. I mean, yeah. I think that you're exactly right. The temptation is is there and it's a good parallel also with the sanctions because I, I think it, it gives you the ability to do something without really doing something. Right. <laughs> so that's attractive. But the problem is that then you you still have the fundamental problem and you've, you've either not done something or you've only done a really, really small thing. And yeah. it's not that some of these different proxy strategies couldn't have worked you know, the SDF is one where they had tremendous military success, most of the others a lot less so. Um, but a lot of what I when I would speak to, you know, the US military commanders or, you know, intelligence forces that were working with them, a lot of these proposals, when they get ginned up initially to the executive office, they are, you know, proxy forces plus something else. So the, the back to the initial like train and equip program that was supposed to send forces into Syria. You know, the assessments of generals at the time was, yes, this could do something if they had some basic levels of like U.S., you know, not even high numbers of troops, but like mentorship or like, you know, something on the ground that was actually with them, some degree of air cover, like not just sending in a ragtag group into Syria and like hoping they don't lose their weapons to Nusra. You know, same thing even when you go back to the Afghan local police, the special force that had originally designed that had said, this isn't a silver bullet, it's not a cure-all, but this is something that could help you at a local level in a couple of communities where it makes sense, where it's strategic, if they're supported by a broader panoply of not only security forces, but a government governance and development strategy that's in line with it. So I think part of the problem is there can be this temptation to say like, by having this very small, you know, tactical level intervention, you can address these larger problems. And then we don't have to get into the other things that are required. And that's just not proven to be the case again and again. It, the surrounding, whether it's the force posture or it's other U.S. political measures or positions, they also matter in whether these are successful or not. So, yes, I do think presence and, and it, you know, generals may be tempted to use these in the future. But I think what, what's what been proven is it also matters to think about the broader strategy. And the, what I'm documenting in the book, which is how there can be this fixation on addressing these problems through very minor, minor technical things, in a way it just reinforces that cycle to look for these quick technical fixes rather than dealing with the larger strategic issues at question. I've just been doing a show on sanctions, and we talked to Danny Glazier, who is you know one of the architects of the sanctions on Iran at the Treasury, and he said, "Look, if sanctions is your only policy, you don't really have a policy." And so I think what I'm taking away from you is, if proxy warfare is your only policy, then you probably don't have a policy. Yeah. Ex yes. Exactly. And and this was in in each of the cases, even this was the information that was available at the time. So when the when yeah. Obama was faced with the decision to arm Syrian rebels through, you know, covert CIA funding, the CIA did an internal study, was asked when this has ever worked, particularly if they're not accompanied by U.S., you know, forces and personnel. The answer that came back was never. <laughs> that was the decision that, that well, they were I mean, the CIA actually had a, So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the CIA played a, I mean, look, the proxy forces in, in during the 1980s uh, pushed the Soviets uh, out of Afghanistan. Um that was pretty successful, but I met that may be an exception that proves the rule. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, then that was, I mean, they're drilling down in that example a little bit. I mean, there was no American, no, the, the Pakistanis wouldn't allow the Americans anywhere near the Afghans. I mean, they controlled the money. Um, and there were no Americans ever set foot in Afghanistan, except maybe just to get a shot, you know, a tourist shot of them sort of stepping over the border. But, um, but clearly, there are issues with doing it, but clearly the United States continues to do it. Um, and so I, in, relatedly, I wanted to get your opinion. As you know, the Biden administration has been negotiating withdrawal from Iraq of the 2,500 mm. soldiers that are there. It's not clear exactly where the negotiation is, how many people would be pulled out when. And obviously, the Trump administration will come in and inherit this pullout. But um, it seems to me that for Iraqi politicians, it's great to be able to say we're negotiating the Americans leaving, if, if they're particularly if they're pro, you know, aligned with Iran. For both the Biden administration and the Trump administration, it may be also be great to say, you know, U.S. troops are leaving to the extent that anybody's paying attention. 
but we saw how the movie played out at the end of 2011 when American forces were pulled out by the Obama team and then they had to go back in 2014 because of the rise of ISIS. So what do you make of the... And those forces are all in an advise and assist mission for the Iraqi military. What do you make of the negotiations and what do you think of if, if the Americans really were to draw down to close to zero, would it have some sort of psychological impact? After all, in Iraqis' minds, you know, ISIS took over most of the country. It wasn't that long ago. It was a decade ago. A lot of Iraqis lived through that. I'm sure they don't want to do it again. So do you, they're not exactly proxies. I mean, I think you and uh, Doug Olivant, when you were writing about this, had a debate. Uh, but, the, you know, we're supporting elements of the Iraqi military with an advise and assist mission. Right. Yeah, no, it's a real issue right now. I mean, it, and not just, I will say, even just beyond the sort of discussion of U.S. troop withdrawals, you know, that same is happening here with also they're negotiating the withdrawal of the main U.N. mission there. You know, the Iraqi government has been asking the Security Council, like, is basically like, take us off your agenda. We're, <laughs> we're fixed. Um, so, yeah, so it is a major issue. It is a major transition point, And I can see it being tempting both for U.S., policy perspectives and also for Iraqi policy perspectives. I think the, you know, the issue or the loss would probably be that maybe while there doesn't need to be like a frontal U.S. mission there, there has been sort of at this point a longstanding over a decade before that, similarly many years, levels of kind of, of lower level cooperation between U.S. military and Iraqi services, particularly the counterterrorism service, that have been really valuable for them in terms of internal stability. And we did see the effects of that when that was pulled out with the withdrawal of U.S. forces the first time. It's not the only reason that led to the rise of ISIS, but it certainly did contribute to it. And there's also a lot of Iraqis who, while they don't want over U.S. you know control of their policy or influence of their policy, there are ways that the U.S. influence has provided a check against interference by others in the region, like Iran in particular. And so I can imagine that for those Iraqis, the, you know, the sort of giant sucking sound that will be left when the U.S. pulls back is, is not necessarily welcome news, because I think they, you know, there are parts of the, you know, Iraq is a very diverse country, has many different perspectives, ethnicities, political, you know, you name it. And so they also don't want their policies to be dominated by their near neighbor, Iran, either. So that is a, an issue. Um, we fix our technical problems, so I think some audience members may come back. So um, if if there are any, please submit your questions, and but we'll just continue uh, having our discussion for the moment. So on the Afghan local police, I remember going in uh, December of 2010 to Scotty Miller was uh, overseeing it at the time, and you know, it, I guess it seemed like a pretty good idea in the sense that um, these are people who know their communities. Um, they have an in, a lot of them have an interest in the Taliban not taking over for one reason or another. Um, they were supposed to be vetted by the Ministry of the Interior, as I recall. Um, was that? I mean, with it obviously had problems, but was it a was it a least bad idea at the time? Meaning that you had some kind of vetting, you had some kind of structure. It wasn't just the there were going to be these police guys in this village anyway, but now they're more part of a structure. Or yeah. do you think the idea was sort of doomed from the start? Yeah, no. It, I think, I don't know about least bad idea. There were parts of the idea that probably had merit in that it probably could have worked in some communities, like in the dozen communities that they started out with the pilot one, in that you had those dynamics. You had these forces that were already there. They were pretty embedded in tribal structures. And so they had this kind of more natural accountability. Um, and they were able, there was capacity to support them, i.e. from special forces, but also other developments so that they could actually be a little bit of a bubble of security. The problem with the ALP was that it didn't stay with that small size, slow growth model that actually a lot of special forces proposed because there were these pressures to have it be the fix, the silver bullet in Afghanistan. It was sort of blown out immediately such that within two years, you don't have like a couple, you know, 12 pilot sites, you've got 30,000 forces. Mm -hmm. in, and many of them, in part because they're linked to this Ministry of Interior process now, which was kind of one of the worst you know, institutions in terms of corruption, a record of predatory behavior. So many of them 
are just directly channeled into the pockets of warlords. So they just become like their own little mini generators of instability in their communities rather than protection. And a lot of the special forces that were originally working with the OP, they will say that was the problem, was when it gets supercharged to an industrial level. I think we, I did some research going back into it and trying to find where were good cases, like because there it has such an overall bad reputation, but it's like, there must be some where it worked and there were some, but I think the reality is that the number of communities where this would have worked well and been a force for stability as opposed to instability was probably not enough to have a strategic effect. So this was probably never going to be the answer. Could have been part of other solutions to respond to the Taliban, but, you know, supersizing it across Afghanistan probably wasn't a good idea. Right. And then, so on the Free Syrian Army, you know, as you point out, um, they were not supposed to fight Assad, which, of course, was what they wanted to do. They were supposed to fight ISIS. But, I mean, I think also Obama had been so burned by the experience in Libya where, you know, he basically sort of essentially authorized the overthrow of Gaddafi that he didn't really want to do anything of any consequence in Syria. Did that sort of hamstring the effort from the start? Yeah. Yeah. So and and on the Free Syria Army, I should say, too, you know, there's so many different initiatives that go into supporting them and also by many other countries. It's really only that first train and equip where they, they literally made them give a pledge saying we, we pledged to fight um, against ISIS. You know, so it's really that one was the one that was the most egregious. The others, they were definitely recruiting groups or providing support to ones that that were fighting both. Um, nonetheless, I think that the broader issue that a lot of people have pointed out with the Free Syrian Army was that, you, you know, you you did have so many of them that were funded not just by the U.S., by, you know, Gulf countries, by, you know, receiving additional support from Turkey. And a lot of them really kind of got, you know, almost donor driven in a way <laughs> in, in following different agendas that weren't necessarily their own. So there's a lot of arguments that this didn't allow them to coalesce into a larger movement that would have actually been able to counter Assad. You know, then there are after the Russian intervention and the additional air power that that brought and the unwillingness to match that on those that were supporting the Free Syrian Army. You know, you just end up, you know, this sort of classic, like going to a gunfight with a knife, you know, it, it no longer was relevant what what kind of support was being supported to the Free Syrian Army. Um, but I do think you're right that that reticence, Obama, def and it's definitely in the record, I discuss it a little bit in the book too. There's clear evidence that he looked at what had happened in Libya and was like, this didn't go well. There is a lot of signs it could go even worse in Syria because of the differing nature there and just not seeing a compelling case for a more decisive uh, U.S. effort. So I think that definitely influenced it. But I think, you know, this is where I'm not sure if the half in, half out approach to say, well, we'll just support some of these free Syrian army fighters. And there were even discussions within the administration to say, we'll give them enough to be resistance, but not enough to take over because there was a fear that they could be even worse than Assad on certain things like on counterterrorism, that it would have yeah. sort of a catastrophic. So that sort of like ambivalence that existed even, even within the administration, I think was really difficult in terms of guiding an overall policy. Well, and this is a, uh, a debate that has played out often in American foreign policy. So, I mean, like going back to the eighties in Afghanistan, obviously it wasn't until 86 that um, Reagan authorized the Stinger missile, which basically ended Russian air, Soviet air superiority. Um, I mean, there was a, it was only really with the second Reagan term what we there was a decision made to like we're going to not just bleed the Russians a bit here. We're going to actually give the Mujahideen enough support to win the war. And there's a version of that debate, obviously, come happening in Ukraine right now, right? Where um, you know it, it, we're give, giving enough aid to you so that Ukraine can kind of survive. The Russian onslaught, but probably not enough for them to have any, uh, you know, uh, ability to actually push the Russians out, or certainly the ability to, to attack uh, Russia directly. Mm -hmm. um, so proxy. So with the, with the proxies, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, it's it's very interesting because you, the the ALP might have been more successful if it had been smaller and yet would have had no big effect on the on the on the right. on the actual course of the conflict yeah yeah so 
It's a tough one. No, as you point out, I think I think these examples. So you know, I focus a lot on these these different proxy forces in the book, and you know, these sort of forever wars that were happening. And now it's almost like we've moved into a different era of warfare. But I think a lot of these lessons that we've been talking about are still relevant if you think about approaching the strategic challenge in Ukraine or think about, you know, dilemmas over U.S. security assistance in Israel right now. A lot of these recur in other places. They're like a, a fundamental question of how you're trying to deal with these strategic risks. And, you know, I think some of these approaches are just trying to say like, well, we'll just, you know, do a sort of like very DC tactical technical fix here and that's going to resolve it. They just, they fall short of accomplishing that objective. But they fall short for good, for reasons that are understandable, <laughs> unfortunately, because I mean, you know, like to have, let's say to have ended the Syrian civil war, or overthrown Assad um, would have involved, you know, substantial numbers of American troops. And as you pointed out, what replaces Assad could have been worse, or certainly, you know, the, still, the Libyan civil war continues Um to this yeah. day, 12 years after Obama sort of authorized the overthrow effectively of Gaddafi. And I mean, you look at the, the proxy warfare strategies in Libya at one, one point, I mean, uh, New America did a pretty deep dive just on the air campaign. There were six or seven nations that were bombing parts of Libya at one point, you know, the Turks, the French, the Americans, the Russians, the, the Emiratis, the, you know, the a lot of people got into that war. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And each with their own proxies. You know, it's sort of the, Libya is called the kind of jokingly the kingdom of militias because they're just so enshrined within the government structures and also the whatever you want to call the Western half, the Eastern half structures that are there as well. Um, but yeah, and proxy forces on, on both sides, whether that's mercenaries or private military and security companies or these local forces. Yeah. And we're saying, seeing the same thing play out in Sudan right now, as I understand it, the Emiratis are pretty deeply involved. And but you know, uh, and th this all suggests that I mean, it's not just the United States that employs this strategy; it's quite a lot of other countries, yeah. um, and they do it for a variety of reasons. One one thing we haven't discussed, but I know you've done a lot of thinking about this, is and your book is called Illusions of Control. So I presume that's a reference to the question of, you know, you've got a proxy that you're, you've got a client or a proxy that you're supporting, but they don't necessarily do what you want. They do kind of, I mean, I mean, a classic example is Israel right now. I mean, Lloyd Austin and Secretary Blinken sent this note 30 days ago saying, we'll give you no more aid if you don't do a bunch of things, none of which the Israelis have done and there's no consequences. So um, whether it's a client state or a proxy force, people are going to pursue their own interests, often which may conflict with your own interests, the, you, the, the the patron. So yeah, discuss a little bit about, about that issue. Yeah, absolutely. No, and that's really central in the book. It, so it, I should say, too, it is, you know, for readers who've come back and enjoyed, uh, this is a, it is an academic book by design. And so I do engage with some of these academic theories of proxy warfare, of which that is a central one. Although, because it is based on my field research in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, I hope it doesn't entirely read as a too academic book. But no, this is, this is central to most proxy warfare. There's a lot of this, you know, they call principal agent theory within academic literature. And it's this idea that you analogize outsourcing warfare to your proxy or your agent as a sort of contract. And, you know, you say, oh, you go and do these war fighting tasks and I'll give you this and this. Um, but the problem is that agents have their own agency and they, in fact, may want to do their own thing as opposed to it. And so this idea of exerting control mechanisms, which is, you know, the analogy I borrow for all of these things in the book, is the idea that you can say, okay, well, maybe you can do this vetting to try to find a like-minded agent, or maybe you can you know, try to set up monitoring devices, or maybe you can, you know, create sanctions or penalties that you can actually control your agent. But the problem in a lot of these conflict settings is that they're the sort of settings that are least likely, where these control mechanisms are least likely to work. They're going to be the most costly to implement because, you know, if you had all the resources to do the monitoring, you could go out there and do the task yourself. Or, you know, and it, or because 
you know, you're in a situation like, let's say, Iraq, or you just mentioned Libya, where you're not the only proxy patron. There's a lot of other ones. And so it's really easy for the agent to default and go do something else for somebody else at another price. Um, so these environments tend to be the worst ones for control. But they're also the ones where we, you know, often are faced with you know, there's no other security partner out there. What I look at in the book, though, is that actually when you get down to it and you look at all of these things that look on their face like they are attempting to control these proxies and, and make sure that they're aligned with the interest and the tasks that have been given to them, a lot of them, when you dig down into it, they don't come about because of an intent to control the proxies. A lot of them emerge just because of kind of back and forth within the policy debate. So like, let's take that example of the congressionally imposed train and equip program and the requirement that they fight only ISIL and not Assad. That had nothing to do with the actual risks they were worried about with the forces. It was an attempt of Congress to control the Obama administration and make sure that this wasn't a slippery slope so that they would then engage in a larger conflict in Syria. Um, or you see a lot of these other cases where, you know, say the State Department has concerns about the program it can't kill the program, but it will at least try to induce, introduce some of these, you know, accountability or other mechanisms or things that will slow the process down so that it, it can't get too big. It can't get to the worst ones. So a lot of times, you know, it, we think that it's about controlling the proxy, but it's actually about controlling the policy process in ways that can actually kind of distort some of the decision making around it. The Syrian Democratic Forces, that does seem to be um, a success. Uh, you know, caveating that, you know, as you indicated earlier, it really had pissed off the Turks for... And, Which and is no small loss. I mean, a lot of people look at Syria, notwithstanding the human loss, will say that was the biggest kind of strategic loss coming out of that yeah. conflict. But anyway, yeah. But both Obama and Trump obviously felt they could live with it. So um, are there lessons about Syrian democratic forces in particular that let's stipulate that, yeah. Yeah. Turkey got pissed off, uh, yeah. but but the kind of goal of just defeating ISIS was a, on the geographical side was achieved uh, by you know sort of midway through the Trump administration for the sake of argument. Um, if I'm an American policymaker, I mean well, I, I, clearly American policymakers thought the price was worth it, and the Syrian Democratic forces didn't seem to play ball more or less with American goals or I mean getting to this agent proxy question yeah no and I think you know a lot of it is to who the the SDF was in itself so the SDF you know as opposed to at that point in the conflict for the past you know five plus years the U.S. had been working with a range of Syrian forces um, had trouble you know getting basic in some cases military tactics in some cases major problems with misconduct affiliation with armed groups including with ISIS and Nusra you know, this whole slate of problems. The SDF comes in, they're a well-organized force. They actually have command and control, by some respects better than other organized military, you know, across the region by by certain towns of it. Um, they are not angels by any means, but they definitely, most people would say, had better conduct than most of the forces in the Syrian civil war. Um, they even come with this sort of, you know, democratic language and like promoting female fighters and things like that. So from the U.S. perspective, this was sort of like a dream force and they're military capable. They're actually capable of taking territory and holding it and then doing the sort of administrative things that are required afterwards. For example, taking parts of the local population and themselves building them into local civil defense units, you know, sort of little ALPs, but much more successful and better controlled. So they had that capacity and capability. You don't necessarily have that in every proxy scenario. I mean, part of the reason that the Department of Defense balked so much when Trump proposed cutting the funding was that they were, you know, they spent a lot of years working with the SDF. They recognized their strategic values, but there was also a lot of just loyalty of like recognizing, hey, this is a this is a strong force that we've worked with, and they had developed sort of their own, you know, client ties, if you will, with them. So I think, yeah, the SDF is an interesting example. It's not one that's necessarily replicable in every proxy environment. And is it I don't they... know if Trump will make the same decision to hold it in the next term. I, I don't know that U.S. support will be indefinite there. Yeah. I mean, and there are still 900 American soldiers in Syria, presumably mostly liaising with the Syrian Democratic Forces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
But it sounds like the Syrian Democratic Forces, unlike, let's say, the Free Syrian Army, which was sort of like a made up thing that didn't really exist. Uh, I mean, A was operating as a pretty sizable conventional, quasi conventional military force with sort of all that that comes with it. I mean, so, uh, yeah, as you say, it, often you're if you're supporting more of a ragtag militia, that's a different thing than supporting sort of a quasi military force that has already shown the ability to hold territory and take territory and presumably has a sort of command and control structure that sort of actually works and where there is some sort of accountability and they're not behaving like the sort of like yeah. a armed criminal gang. Right. And and indeed, and, and you would see that in the way that the U.S. dealt with the SDF as well, you know, where there were concerns that were raised. So there were concerns about whether they were leaving out, you know, Arab communities in certain areas and things like that. Usually, as opposed to the others where the U.S. has to kind of try and figure out a way to make that happen on the ground, they would simply relay this to the command leadership. And then, you know, there's a response or there were concerns about child soldiers. Um, you know, they they persist everywhere in Syria, but trying to raise them and then actually having a military that's able to take forward an inquiry and, and command. So it's, it's a different structure. And you did you get a fair amount of cooperation from American uh, generals, policymakers? about this issue when you were reporting research? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I interviewed everyone from, you know, Petraeus and, and McChrystal down to, you know, commanders who were working very, you know, special forces who were on the ground working with these, both in, in these countries and outside of it afterwards. And I think it really resonated with a lot of commanders in particular, because I think a lot of them did see ways that these, you know, these efforts to sort of um, regulate some of these security assistance or to kind of use a limited proxy force when there was a much larger solution. I think they saw they saw some of the issues with that and that they were they were essentially put in a position of trying to patch it together that wasn't really working. So I think you know some of them were probably a little bit you know happy to talk to somebody about it finally because it was sort of the thing they had been struggling with for years. And many of them would say, of course, that it, it's not that you shouldn't have standards when you're working with security partners, but would find that the way that they were kind of set up to do that didn't allow them to do it in a way that was consistent enough or that either in a way that would allow sort of military tactical success or that might, say, restrain chances of, of misbehavior or misconduct or things like that. Right. So there's the natural Washington tendency to what kind of manage things from 3000 miles away with a screwdriver which i presume doesn't really work with these forces right exactly you know and i i think a lot of them would say that that the most effective methods that they felt that they had to shape behavior you know tactically and and in terms of other things was where they had longer standing partnerships or where they had really close embedding and mentoring so you know you're working with these forces over a decade okay then you can start to shape behavior you know, you just go in and you're shuttling guns and money to them and asking them to sign a paper saying they won't commit abuse is probably less effective. So if there were, if if there were, for, for my last question here, because we're close to time, if there were a set of recommendations to make this work, understanding that Afghanistan is very different from Syria and Syria is very different from Iraq. And, but what are the, what are the recommendations you have? Overall, it would just be this re-emphasis on when there are decisions about supporting these proxy forces, or one could argue, you know, rent large and security assistance. I would really want to see more of a, a pushing back against this tendency to sort of adopt a technical or tactical level fix rather than considering the larger strategic implications within that. And really thinking about how the policies that are now kind of embedded in, in the bureaucracy, whether they really service that or they sort of reinforce the tendency to, to check the box rather than doing that. And that could be on everything from some of the human rights centered um, protocols to those that are related to how we try to make sure we screening out for things like terrorism or security risks like that. Um, you know, check the box just hasn't worked really well. And it's worth uh, thinking more about how we support sort of long-term strategic thinking on these issues. Great. Well, thank you very much, Erica. The book is Illusions of Control, Dilemmas in Managing U.S. Proxy Forces in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Congratulations on the book. And uh, 
sorry about all technical issues um, and uh, very good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you too. Bye. Bye.